changing the world. Yeah, right. Who wants yeah, to speak right. first? That's not, yeah. Yeah. Hey, really, <clears throat> Are we waiting for any other council members? Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the members of the City Council who are with us today. We're joined by Council Members <coughs> Keith Powers, Carlina Rivera, Alika Amprey Samuel, co chair of the BLAC, the Black Latino Asian Caucus, Idanis Rodriguez, Donovan Richards, who we're going to hear from, Roy Lanceman, who we're going to hear from, and Costa Constantinides. I really want to thank you all for being here today, and I'm really uh, happy to welcome my long friend, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, for this important uh, press conference today. Uh, the issue that we hear about, marijuana arrests in New York City, is an incredibly important issue that deserves our attention now. Again, I want to thank all of my colleagues for being here, and I want to thank Reverend Sharpton for coming to City Hall today, and I want to thank Minister Kirsten John Foy, the Northeast Regional Director of the National Action Network. We are here today because racial disparities in marijuana arrests we've witnessed for years uh, are coming to light in an even bigger way. Uh, today, we're seeing the home-based program remains at the core of New York City's homelessness prevention efforts. At home-based sites, New Yorkers are assessed to determine prevention and diversion tools for which they're eligible, including on-site processing and triage for public assistance and rental assistance, landlord and family mediation, educational advancement, employment, and financial literacy services. We now operate 23 locations through uh, 16 uh, different providers. Uh, we will be expanding to 25 locations by the end of 2000, uh, FY18. Since 2014, we've nearly tripled the program's funding because we recognize it is critical to keep New Yorkers in their homes. In FY18, we increased funding to include community-based. He did the original piece in February, and then there was a New York Times story uh, yesterday that followed up on it about how neighborhoods where people complain about marijuana at the same rate, the rate of arrests in areas with black and Hispanic people are substantially higher. The council did our own analysis. Do we have those maps anywhere where they hand it out? We'll hand them out. Um, we did our own analysis of the data that we received from the NYPD, and 311 and 911 call records do not explain the disparities in arrests. They simply don't. They don't explain it. The numbers don't make any sense. They don't match. You go precinct by precinct. Uh, call by call, and the numbers don't add up. Um, it made me angry to see that. This is not what our city is about. We are needlessly running people through the criminal justice system. This is why I support and have supported legalizing marijuana. The law is being unevenly enforced. These arrests are ruining lives. We are here today to say that we've had enough. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this is not really going to end until marijuana is legalized, taxed and regulated in New York City. And we're calling on our colleagues in the criminal justice system to take a hard look at this issue and do better. While we're waiting for the state to act, New York City should take its own action. And so today I'm calling upon the NYPD to instead of making arrests when someone is smoking pot in public, they should issue a summons. That's a big difference. Instead of arresting someone, issue a summons, which is what they do right now for low level possession. I really wanna thank the district attorneys, Cy Vance and Eric Gonzalez for looking at changing their policies. Uh, they have already been handling the prosecution in a different way. And uh, I really believe that, you know, ultimately for us to be a city that talks about closing down Rikers Island and for us to be a city that talks about changing the criminal justice system here, the only way to do that is to ensure that our policing policies in New York City are being handled consistently and fairly across all neighborhoods and across all races. That is not the case in New York City today. The numbers don't lie. So before we can hopefully legalize marijuana, and again, I don't smoke marijuana, I'm sober nine years, uh, but before we can actually do that, 
We need to actually change the policies so that less people are caught up in our criminal justice system. With that, I want to introduce, before we call up the members of the City Council to speak, I want to introduce my friend and a leader on this issue and in our city, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson. Let me say that the last 24 hours, what we have read about the racial disparities in marijuana arrest should be intolerable in a city that proved that the racial disparities in stop and frisk could be dealt with while at the same time bring crime down. Many that fought in the courts and those of us that marched in the streets, including the well-known Fifth Avenue silent march that I and others led, led on Father's Day, led to us changing the stop and frisk procedure that became instructive nationwide and at the same time have the lower crime rates to complement uh, the lowering and the changing of stop and frisk that had been predicted that if they stopped the process of the policies of stop and frisk, crime would go up. Now the grandchild of stop and frisk is marijuana arrest based on race. Mm -hmm. When you look at the fact that the 911 calls do not match the arrest, when you look at the fact that there are more arrests in a black dominated district like Queens Village as opposed to Forest Hills, same type of activity, and on and on around the city, there is a clear racial pattern as it was in stop and frisk. So many of us that were involved and were successful in working against stop and frisk, including with this administration, we find it incumbent upon us and obligated to stand and say that the city and all of the people in the criminal justice area, including prosecutors, must stop the criminalization of blacks in these marijuana arrests that has been clearly laid out by the data. Nash Action Network and I have been for legalization for those reasons for some time. But legalization must also be done with a policy of discussion of how we legalize it, where and how we give the, uh, the uh, dispensaries, because we must have blacks participate in that. And some of the laws that some of the very ones that have sold marijuana cannot become an owner in the business. So there's a lot to wrestle with that I would hope that our legislators and governor will sit down because we need to decriminalize the use of marijuana. But in the process, we need to suspend using arrests where we can have summonses and where we can sit down and understand why this racism has been institutionalized and in how arrests are made on marijuana. If we are the city that showed the nation that you can stop, stop and frisk and bring crime down, we should be the nation that stops, the city that shows the nation how you can stop the criminalizing of blacks using marijuana arrest. It is, in my opinion, providential that we, the hometown of the sitting president, who will not even discuss this, should be the ones to instruct the nation in this. So I'm very happy uh, that when I talked to the speaker that we decided to take this stand together. And uh, let me say I've known Corey since he was a young uh, campaign worker for me for the, uh, my presidential campaign in 2004. He worked in New Hampshire. And uh, he uh, took me to bars down in the village <laughs> uh, telling uh, the LGBTQ community not uh, to uh, worry to vote for me for president. The village of Manhattan, not in New Hampshire. <laughs> you, you took me to the village of, Man of Manhattan, not New Hampshire. <laughs> I did not make the corner office of the White House, but I just left his corner office at City Hall 
So these disparities must end. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend. Uh, before I call members of the council, I want to invite up from the National Action Network, Minister Kirsten John Foy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, for your leadership, both on this issue. In the early 20th century, we saw the government try to deal with alcohol by instituting prohibitions. Those prohibitions resulted in the criminalization of the Irish and the, and the Italians in the North, criminalization of blacks, African Americans in the South. A hundred years later, we see marijuana prohibition being used to criminalize communities of color, Latino communities, African American communities. We see that the data does not comport with the arrest. So there is no question that criminal, decriminalization and indeed legalization is the only way to eliminate the scourge of arrests that are being used to harm our communities. There is no moral rationale for continuing prohibition of marijuana. It is destroying families, it is destroying communities, it is destroying lives. There is no financial uh, uh, reason for continuing prohibition. We are eliminating an entire industry that can provide uh, uh, additional tax revenues for our city and our state, and we are eliminating ourselves from an industry that is not going anywhere in terms of potential ownership and jobs for people of color. It makes no medical sense when the entire country is dealing with an opioid epidemic that is ravaging communities across the nation to have Big Pharma profit off of this addiction, to continue to criminalize marijuana, which has been shown, can deal with the opioid crisis and act as an adequate replacement for opioids in terms of pain reduction and medical treatment. It makes no medical sense. It makes no political sense when the entire nation realizes that A, we all, in our communities know people who smoke marijuana. We all in our communities know people and our families know people who smoke marijuana and continue to be productive citizens in society. And those people vote. And those people are tired of having their communities and their families criminalized by the prohibition of marijuana. If we really want to deal with the ending of the era of mass incarceration, we can start by eliminating the prohibitions on marijuana. And then we can start dealing with other things, like how we can reduce the jail populations. You cannot, on the one hand, talk about closing Rikers Island, as had been said, and on the other hand, continue to amass arrest after arrest after arrest in communities of color. It just does not make any sense. And so now we must move forward in wisdom. We must move forward in knowledge. We have the data which shows that marijuana is not as destructive as people have claimed it is. It can be a, an adequate uh, replacement for opioids in terms of medical applications. It just makes no sense. And anyone on the other side of this issue, as I've said before, maybe needs to take some ginkgo biloba Maybe they need to take a few shots themselves of caffeine, wake up their brain cells, wake up their neurons, and approach this intelligently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call up the chair of our Public Safety Committee, I just want to point this out for one second. The council did an analysis, and I know that, of course, Politico and The Times and other media outlets. Just take one police precinct. The 76th police precinct, uh, Red Hook in Brooklyn. The number of 311 and 911 calls that came in complaining uh, in 2017 were 88 calls. The number of arrests in that precinct, in the 76th precinct, were 246 arrests. The numbers don't add up. You look at Breezy Point and the lower part of the Rockaway Peninsula, and there were 113 calls to 311 and 911, but only 22 arrests. The Rockaway Peninsula, that part, is predominantly a white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Red Hook is predominantly a Hispanic and African-American neighborhood with a significant amount of public housing. 
it shows the enormous disparity that exists precinct by precinct, neighborhood by neighborhood in New York City. Yesterday, we had our budget hearing uh, in the Public Safety Committee, which was led by our fantastic chair, who has been working very hard on this issue since he became chair, and even before that, Chair Donovan Richards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to Reverend Sharpton and uh, Pastor Kirsten Foy. Today we are here for one simple reason, and that is to end the racist policy of primarily targeting black and brown communities with low-level marijuana arrests and summonses. Let's look at the facts once again. Nearly 90% of all summonses and arrests in New York City were handed down to black and brown people. And as Commissioner O'Neill said yesterday, a startling 36% of those arrested had no prior records. Let me repeat that. 36%, at least 36% of those arrested had no prior criminal history. The 105th Precinct, which covers a black middle-class neighborhood, a stronghold, has led the city nine out of the last 10 years in marijuana arrests and summonses. Something is wrong with that. Well, it's apparent that Jim Crow policing is being perpetuated by the NYPD, who, and by the NYPD who up until yesterday are still using convoluted 911 and 311 data to justify what is unjustifiable. And this hypocrisy, and this is hypocrisy at its best, because as the city justifiably addresses the opioid crisis through programs to keep one class of folks out of the criminal justice system, we are continuing to grow an unjust, undercast system exclusively for people of color who may smoke marijuana. This is the classic story called The Tale of Two Cities, where it reads, if you are black and smoke marijuana, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. And if you are white and smoke marijuana, you still go to Yale. And as other cities and states move to decriminalize marijuana, the supposed most progressive city in the world has young men and women of color languishing behind bars as we stand here today. Arresting people for marijuana destabilizes families and communities while locking them out of the job market. So how do we fix this? One, we can start by decriminalizing marijuana right here and right now. Two, we can release any marijuana offenders in jail or prison and seal all criminal histories of those who are arrested for marijuana offenses going back decades. Three, we should also reinvest the windfall of cash back into communities that were most adversely affected by this war on drugs. Reminder, Colorado took in more than $247 million in revenue from marijuana sales last year. Did someone say fair fares? Let me be clear. On this one final note, legalization should benefit Main Street and not Wall Street. Our community should be prioritized through the permitting process, and this should be a part of any legislation that is enacted in Albany. We want contracts and not simply contact. In closing, as Peter Tosh once famously sang, legalize it and don't criminalize it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richards. I want to call up the chair of our committee on the justice system, someone, again, who has uh, led on this and had really has been pushing the NYPD for greater transparency, uh, Chair Roy Lantzman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, everyone. It's important to understand that a central tenet of policing in this city for decades now has been to find rationale for touching, putting their hands on as many black and Latino people as possible. As Reverend Sharpton alluded to, it used to be stop and frisk, where at one point over 600,000 New Yorkers a year, almost all of them black and Latino, were stopped, frisked, questioned for no reason whatsoever. We see it in fare evasion, where tens of thousands of New Yorkers are stopped a year, almost all of them black and Latino, for the most minor of offenses, in, invariably a crime of poverty. 
And that is what marijuana policing has become in New York City as well. Tens of thousands of mostly young, overwhelmingly black and Latino New Yorkers run through the criminal justice system for possessing low-level, small amounts of marijuana. The origin of this, and I'm going to speak frankly here, I hope I don't make anyone uncomfortable. The origin of this is a belief, and I'm part of our police department, our part of our criminal justice system, that black and Latino young people represent disorder, and that there is this compulsion to engage with them on a regular basis. Because if we weren't stopping them constantly for this, that, or the other thing, the city would break down. When Donovan and I had the hearing on marijuana policing and prosecution in February, we were told, well, the police were only responding to the 911 and 311 calls that we get from the community. And I have to say that under the leadership of Speaker Johnson, Donovan and I knew that if we pressed the police department to release that data, that the council would have our back. And then that when that data was released, we would have the staff and the determination to analyze it. And we did, as Speaker Johnson mentioned, the Times, the Daily News, Politico, all did, and came to the same conclusion that all of us know, just as New Yorkers, as individual New Yorkers, and as representatives of our districts, that policing, marijuana policing in New York City is profoundly unfair, disproportionate, and cannot be justified by anything other than a fundamental racial animus that is unfortunately at the core of our criminal justice system. So, as Corey said, we don't need to wait for Albany to act. That's my message here today. We have the power within New York City to make an enormous change in how marijuana possession, marijuana smoking is policed and enforced. The police department, the mayor's police department, can choose to do things differently if it wants to. And I call on the district attorneys, the five district attorneys in New York City, to exercise their discretion, their authority, to not prosecute marijuana possession cases. That is a moment where the criminal justice system can reckon with what it is doing to so many black and Latino New Yorkers. And I'll close by reminding everyone, the police will not police what prosecutors will not prosecute. And I call on our prosecutors to use their judgment and to do justice and do justice for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lanceman. I want to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Brad Lander, Councilmember Mark Traeger, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Jumani Williams, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and Councilmember Robert Cornegie. Uh, last up, I want to call up the co-chair of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus in the City Council, my friend, he's the chair of the Transportation Committee, Councilmember Adonis Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. As he has been saying, no one should be prosecuted. Uh, for marijuana possession. Using marijuana is part of our country. As President Obama, as Mayor Bloomberg, as most of the leaders that have been in office, as anyone that has any sports figure, as anyone in the acting and the music entertainment, is part of our culture. The difference is that, as it has been said, if you are white, you have the license to use it. If you are black and Latino, then you go to Rikers Island. And you know, in the 13 abatement documentary, you know, we learned the lesson. After we ended slavery, this nation been putting a lot of things in place to send more black and Latino to prisons. So I'm here as a co-chairman of the Black and Latino in Asian Congo, especially as a Latino, because the Latinos share the same consequences as with the black community when it comes to see so many young people going through Rikers Island. And para mí es una oportunidad de sumar la voz latina diciendo hoy de que se debe legalizar la marihuana en la ciudad de Nueva York, en el estado de Nueva York. El tiempo llegó ya. La marihuana es parte de la cultura de esta sociedad. Y nosotros creemos que la diferencia es que si una persona es blanca la puede usar con licencia, si la persona es negra o latina, termina en Rikers Island. Y eso debe de parar. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Juan Manuel? Yeah, for the Reverend Shockton, uh, you always enjoyed a good relationship, working with a relationship with the mayor. Have you spoken to the mayor about this? And uh, why, instead of having the press conference with the speaker, uh, maybe you would like to have the... I, I have, the mayor knows my position. I spoke at the cannabis conference in uh, October of last year at Javits Center. I spoke in Los Angeles. I've spoken on this issue. And uh, to say why won't I talk to the mayor rather than have a press conference, I think is a little confusing to me. We march for Eric Garner and still talk to the mayor. I mean, when does talking stop you from raising public issues? Are you disappointed at this? Oh, now you're trying to change and ask a different question. I am disappointed that there's racial disparities in arrests, as I have been and was disappointed in helping the leadership of Stop and Frisk, and I want to see it corrected. Marsha Kramer. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm taking oh, no, you too. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the red room is now the rev room. <laughs> I talked to her after. I had said that I felt the term reparations was the wrong term. She called me. We talked. She said that she had misspoke in terms of the term, because certainly just doing that is, does not answer reparations for slavery. But there ought to be some repairing of what has been done in terms of the disproportionate arrest, and there ought to be some, t uh, some procedure and process to make sure that blacks and Latinos have their fair share of ownership. This cannot be legalization where the pharmaceutical industry and the big drug companies make the money, mm -hmm. and we were the ones that went to jail. So we must have in, built in the process how we are going to be in the business, which is what I spoke about at the cannabis conference and all. But that's not reparations for slavery. That's doing business fairly particularly in the communities that suffered the brunt of it. Well, seeing as the controller came out with a report today that says that this would be a $3 billion business in the United States and about and most of it in New York City, I wonder how you see this developing if New York State were to legalize marijuana. Well, I think that's what the uh, speaker and I are saying, that we've got to be part of that conversation because built in the legalization <coughs> must also be what are the requirements for ownership, where they will be, and whether we're going to have targeted involvement, Adonis with uh, the Latino community and the black community who had the uh, unequal share of the brunt of it being criminalized. And I think that the, the state and the governor and others must make sure that this is an inclusive process. We can't be the ones that filled up Rikers Island, and they'd be the ones to fill up the bank if it's, <laughs> it's uh, legalized. I, you know, I echo what the Reverend said, but I would just say one thing. I That's mean, good advice. Yes. <laughs> we're, again, we're in the Rev room, not the Red Room. Um, I would just say that, of course, we want to legalize marijuana. Do I think it's going to happen anytime in the very near future? Probably not. In the meantime, the, reason, the real reason why we're here today is to talk about what are the intermediate steps to divert young people and people of color from the criminal justice system. We laid those reasons out collectively, and I think there are some immediate things that can be done here in the city to have less people being caught up, and those are the things we want immediate action on even before we get to the legalization and decriminalization conversation. Well, the, the previous speaker, uh, my predecessor, Speaker Mark Viverito, put together a criminal justice package that 
uh, started undercharging on a variety of offenses. Uh, we did that in collaboration with the NYPD, in cooperation with the NYPD, whether it be being in a park uh, after hours or whatever the issue was, and we moved those down to summonses in some instances. The PD knows how to do this. They could do this. But again, it goes back to a conversation with all five district attorneys, the police commissioner, the mayor, and the city council through legislation. I don't know if we can actually legislate this portion. I don't think we can. But they could, they could decide to do this right away. It requires no. It requires no no legislation. The NYPD could tomorrow could decide to do this in their own discretion. They use their discretion all the time. Mr. Speaker, may I just add? Yes, yeah, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, we saw Commissioner uh, Ray Kelly issue an edict that he was going to instruct the department to no longer arrest people for marijuana. We've seen um, commissioner policies and edicts from various commissioners indicating that they have instructed police not to act on arrests uh, for marijuana. But we have seen those fail in their ability to hold the police back. So now it is required that the city council, along with outside advocates, step up and demand that the police department do what they have promised us already several times under several different commissioners. The police department has made this public commitment several times and have failed to live up to this public commitment. So they can do this because they've promised to do it several times in the past. Uh, just a moment ago to Brendan. Uh, Brendan, you wrote the great piece in February, which exposed much of this data. I want to thank you for that. I think it was enlightening to many of us here at the council after the hearing that we had. So please. I mean, that is a concern, of course, but we think that um, until we can have a change in state law, it's better than actually arresting people on the street, which has much more serious long-term criminal justice-related consequences for their records, for ending up on Rikers Island, for not being able to make bail, uh, for getting caught up like Khalif Browder did in the criminal justice system for something that was considered minor. We think that this is a step in the right direction, a very important step in the right direction, until we can have a much bigger conversation around decriminalization, legalization, taxation, regulation, all the things we talked about. Be summonses are better, but it's not the end goal. That's right. And I think that it is something that could be done immediately. And that when you look at the fact that mm -hmm. arrests stand in the way of some people being able to get housing, mm -hmm. be able to get jobs, be able to, the, the, the arrest itself has impact on ones trying to conduct their lives that a summons doesn't. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's by no means the end uh, go and we will not stop till we get to the end goal. Uh, Donovan? And, and I just want to add that even with summonses, the NYPD can still use discretion. You know, one of the most dangerous things that can happen is if you don't pay that summons and you end up back in court, right, right. for an unpaid summons. So we want right. to, the mayor has certainly spoken of this in the past, and we're not in agreement that even summonses the way that they issued are being done fairly in the city right now. So I don't think that's necessarily the answer, but the P NYPD should and can use discretion to address the disparities that are happening, even with summonses. You all know a few years ago, I yeah. got in trouble for moving in between subway cars, uh, walking from one subway car to the next. And I knew that it was against the rules, but I didn't know I could have been arrested for it. And, the and he's white. Well, that's, that's, that, that, that's the point, is that they didn't arrest me. They, had, they used their discretion, and they gave me a, a, a summons through the Transit Adjudication Bureau. I paid that $75 summons, and that was moving it. Moving between subway Moving in between subway cars. Did they drug test you? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd been black, <laughs> you'd have been arrested, drug tested. And you may never have been speaker. The, P <laughs> the PD uses discretion all the time. We have to end this press conference soon. Uh, uh, Aaron? <laughs>
people are calling about it, they need to respond to that. Um, you know, how would you respond to that? Do you think there is a legitimate concern of people who don't want to have it? Let me answer yeah, that because I got to go, go and then you go. go I think that when you look at the numbers of calls and the numbers of arrests that the speaker released, then you cannot reconcile the two. The people that are calling are much lower in some areas than the, than the arrests made. And when you look at, as they, he showed, the arrest in, in the uh, precincts that, uh, that uh, is represented by uh, Brother Donovan and others, compared to Breezy Point, and Breezy Point is white. Breezy is not a rapper. It's not Breezy the rapper. <laughs> Breezy Point <laughs> is a white area. Then you She's see that that is not the issue at all. I had to think about that. Uh, I got to go. Chris, Goodbye. Chris Breezy. I also want to actually ask Reverend Sharpton another dispute between the speaker and the mayor uh, about the city paying for the fair fares for house prices. We are, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the speaker about that. We, one thing I learned uh, with James Brown, you don't step on your own record. We're on this today. We coming back in the studio on the fair issue very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> are you making any distinction? Thank you, Reverend. Juliet. Well, no, that's the issue right now. The issue right now is if, the, if you have a small amount uh, in your pocket or you're holding it, but you're not smoking it, they'll write you a summons. But if you are smoking it, they will arrest you. And so what we're saying is there should be, until we can legalize it and try to end this war on drugs and handle it in a thoughtful, sane way, we're saying stop arresting for smoking and instead handle it the same way you handle possession. Rich? So I'm old enough to remember when they called marijuana a gateway drug <laughs> and it uh, you know, was seen as, as harmful. Are, is it your belief that it's harmless, that, there's, that this is it's fine to go ahead and legalize it? I mean, what, what I'm reading from what you're saying. Well, I mean, uh, I would say that that there have been many studies that have been done that say that alcohol is a lot more destructive than marijuana. Um, and I don't think we're having any conversation about going back to prohibition in this country, as Chair Richards uh, talked about. Um, so, you know, uh, we live in a society where not everyone loves gambling, and we saw a Supreme Court ruling yesterday on gambling. And there are probably some destructive qualities to gambling. We make decisions all the time on how to handle things, hopefully not from a completely moral judgment, um, but instead, how do we handle it in a rational, sane, and fair way? And right now, the way we handle marijuana in New York City is irrational, insane, and unfair. I mean, shouldn't be, it's gonna, it's smoked in public. It's gonna be smoked in public. So when it's smoked in public, how do you handle it? And we don't believe that uh, jailing young black and Latino men at a substantially higher rate makes any sense. Gloria. Peter, I wanted to ask you about the mayor seemed to begin to shift his tone on this last night. On New York One. So I, I really want to, again, give credit to uh, my colleagues here, I mean, before I get to the, the heart of the question, because uh, the legislation that we passed requiring the transparency around the numbers, I think, is what led to us being able to have a more fulsome conversation related to this. And they, uh, the NYPD and the administration didn't release the numbers in a timely manner. So we kept pressing them and pressing them and pressing them. We're waiting on the numbers. We're waiting on the numbers. Give us the numbers so that we can do a full analysis. And that is what was done by the media. And that was what was done by our amazing analytics and legislative and policy team here at the council when they got the numbers to be able to understand this in a more in-depth way. Yesterday, I called the police commissioner after the hearing, and I called the mayor.
mayor after I called the police commissioner to give them both a heads up that we're having this press conference today to tell them that uh, we were going to be uh, calling uh, for changes to be made from a policy perspective and from a policing perspective. And I think both of them, as you said, Gloria, that the mayor, I think, showed an openness last night to figure out how to fix this and to ensure that we don't have any disparity, racial disparity, when it comes to marijuana policing and arrests. We think that there are some immediate instant steps that can be taken today that will result in less people being criminalized and going to jail. What I called on before, which is the DAs stopping prosecution, the police stopping arresting and issuing summonses, I think those are two immediate things. Noah? Uh, that's a, I, I think I have a long answer to that. I'll try to give you a short answer. The short answer is there are some innovative drug treatment uh, programs that are happening in the counties across New York City. You have the HOPE program, the Heroin Opioid Prevention and Education Program on Staten Island. You have the CLEAR program, which is Dia Gonzalez's program in Brooklyn. So there are drug treatment programs to help people who have gotten caught up in the criminal justice system on drug-related charges so that we're not being punitive, but being helpful to them in getting recovery and in hopefully getting the treatment that they need. That's one good thing, I think, is this is also a about education and prevention and sobriety and recovery and all of those things for people that need that. The other thing is, again, stopping the prosecutions and DAs all the time speak out and advocate on criminal justice matters that they believe are unfair and are bad for our criminal justice system. I believe DA Vance and DA Gonzalez have done that and I'm calling on all the district attorneys to do that. Rory, do you want to say anything on that? Sure. Let me just say that the district attorneys have the authority to decline to, to prosecute. So if a district attorney is presented with a defendant who's charged with a misdemeanor because they were caught um, smoking in public, it's the district attorney's prerogative to charge the lesser offense of a violation. For those who are charged now with the violation and get a summons um, because they're possessing but not smoking, um, it's the district attorney's prerogative to go into court and inform the court that we are not uh, we're declining to, to, to uh, prosecute these violations. I mean, district attorneys have extraordinary authority and discretion, and uh, they have it within their power to greatly influence uh, what the police department does. Case in point, uh, DA Cy Vance announced a few months ago that he was not going to prosecute a large swath of uh, fair evasion uh, misdemeanor charges and as a result, uh, arrests for fair evasion plummeted in Manhattan. So we want the DAs to exercise the authority and discretion so, they have. So would the summons for smoking be across the board, or would that be discretionary, or does it depend on? No, no, we think it should be across the board. Across the board. I mean, ultimately, I mean, I'm not, I can't speak for everyone up here, but ultimately my position is legalize it. So if you're legalized, I don't think there should really be any summonses. But in the meantime, until that happens, we believe that summonses is a fairer route than arrests. Well, what, what guarantees do you give to people who are calling 911 and 311 that their calls matter? A lot of these calls are coming from communities of color. I just want to ensure that I understand that you're, you're not discounting those calls. I'm not discounting those calls, but I think that the much bigger conversation here is, do we need young black and Latino, predominantly men, ending up on Rikers Island and ending up in a criminal justice system because they are smoking marijuana uh, at a much higher rate than young white people in New York City when the use is the same? I mean, there are conversations we can have ultimately about if there is legalization and the I guess quality of life concerns and effects, but I think the reason why we're here today is about the level of disparity that exists and saying that that level of disparity is unacceptable and we believe is racially biased and we're calling for an end to that so that there is actually fairness in New York City. That is the real message. So on the summonses, um, 
Um, the NYPD has continued to arrest people for low-level possession. If they have an active warrant, they're the subject of an investigation. Um, they can't identify themselves. Do you think people caught smoking in public who those criteria apply to, should the arrest still be made in those circumstances? I, I, I think that we will, of course, if the NYPD makes the decision to do this, we could work with them on the particular instances when you're talking about cases like this, it depends on what the warrant is for. You know, if the warrant is for something that is violent and considered, uh, you know, very criminal, then that's a conversation to have. If the, if the warrant is for being in a park overnight uh, by, then I don't think that's the, again, this is all about proportion and not disproportion. If we wanted to get into the details, that's a conversation we could have with the PD. Corey, can I yes, ask go ahead. one thing? Yes. Sorry, um, this is important. Uh, conviction for marijuana uh, uh, as a misdemeanor is potentially a deportable offense. So that is something that we all need to be very conscious of and in considering whether or not somebody who is picked up for an open warrant or some other uh, justification where they can be detained and, and charged for whatever they're alleged to have done, uh, it's not nothing to tack on a, mis mar a misdemeanor marijuana charge, because that can have very serious collateral consequences. Excuse me, Speaker. The data you just collected shows that uh, it's a real disparity between arrests. But my question is, is it possible that uh, NYPD face a legal suit about discrimination during this, the, these actions against the Latino community and black community? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't heard that. You know, there was, of course, one of the major things that I think uh, there were many things, and, and all the folks up here could speak about it, that helped end uh, Stop, Question, and Frisk was there was a lawsuit on this, a federal lawsuit um, that looked at this and looked at the significant racial disparity. I think um, that's not something I've heard about at this point, um, but there is major disparity, and we need answers on why that disparity exists and also a plan for how to end that disparity in New York City. Samar? Speaker, are you worried that, that these disparities happen because the mayor has encouraged broken window policing when it comes to issues, for instance, a hedge fund manager on the Upper West Side complains about you guys put a crackdown, but when it comes to turnstile jumping or marijuana arrests, the low income is responsible. You know, I really think that how do I talk about this in a condensed way? I, I, I really believe that there was a mindset at the top of the NYPD that was Comstat focused, mm -hmm. data driven mm -hmm. on wanting to see a certain number of arrests. Um, and that mentality went down to the precinct by precinct level all across New York City where you had commanders um, not feeling like there was a quota per se, but feeling like they wanted to show that they were creating order in their communities. And that bled over to a variety of things, including marijuana arrests here in New York City. I think that one of the things that we've been able to learn is that while arrests and summonses have gone down tremendously in New York City over the last few years, violent crime and major criminal index crimes uh, have gone down as well. And so those things are not tied together. So I would say that you have to actually be thoughtful and strategic about policing. You have to figure out what type of policing works. You have to build trust in communities. And the, the, the things that we decide to pursue need to be proportionate to the offense that's taking place. For far too long, and we see in this instance, there's a disproportionate response which has an outside impact on the lives of too many New Yorkers, and it goes against all of the talk that you hear from elected officials on criminal justice reform, on closing Rikers Island, on racial and social justice. We need to make sure that the rhetoric matches the actual policies that we seek to have in place. I was, ha Gloria mentioned it, I was happy to see what the mayor said on New York One last night, but now it's not just about um, him saying that. 
now he has to follow up in practice in conversations with the NYPD on how to shift policy around this. Rich? Uh, has it been introduced? Uh, there's a story about it. But, well, I don't know if it, I know, but has it been introduced yet? I don't know if it's been introduced. Well, it's being drafted. Yeah, it's being drafted. I mean, there, there are thousands of bills that are being drafted. No, but I mean, it's out there. I'll answer it, Rich. Okay. Well, there, there are thousands of bills uh, being drafted. Um, I have to actually look at the specifics on this bill. My longstanding position. Uh, you know, from when I first joined the City Council in 2014, is I have serious concerns about the effects that Airbnb has on neighborhoods across New York City. Um, those concerns are concerns around the loss of um, affordable housing units. Those concerns center on complaints that happen inside of buildings, on units that are being warehoused and guests are coming and going next to people who are living full time in their apartments. And the fact that we don't have a full sense of um, who are the people with the listings on Airbnb and wanting a level of transparency in the council's budget response we called for a significant increase for the budget of the mayor's office on special enforcement which one of their primary functions is to go after illegal um, listings um, for these type of uh, websites so the bill will go through the legislative process it will have a hearing at some point I don't know when that hearing is going to happen I haven't had a conversation about when that hearing is going to happen and we'll see what happens but my past position has always been one that has had major concerns on this issue um, but it will again go through the legislative process I'm not carrying that bill and I have to have a conversation with the sponsors I mean I think that they are an important voice They've always been an important voice, but they're not the only voice that's against this. In my own district, um, before I joined the city council, Manhattan Community Board 4 had what was called an illegal hotel, illegal hotels working group that I uh, knew about and our board played a major role in. Some of the major activists across New York City are housing activists. Um, there's a gentleman in my district named Tom Kaler, who's an affordable housing activist, who's been working on this issue for years and years and years, and every single time I see him, he comes over to me and says, what are you doing about illegal hotels and buildings in Chelsea and in Hell's Kitchen and in the Village and in Soho, which has some of the highest numbers? My district <clears throat> has some of the highest numbers. We hear about this not just from uh, unions and folks who are involved, the vast majority of people we hear about are from constituents who are complaining about units in their building that are being illegally warehoused and rented out. There are many voices on this. Of course, there's the Hotel Trades Council. Of course, there's uh, the Hotel Association. And, but predominantly, uh, they're the ones that, that I think uh, are looked at because they have money to spend. And it's important to acknowledge that. They run ads. But the people that we hear from on the ground are renters and people who live in co-ops and condos across New York City. This is actually a rare alliance between the hotel industry, the Hotel Trades Council, uh, and Rebney, who all agree on the same point because they've seen the deleterious effects of what it means to have apartments in buildings that are actually just being used as hotel rooms and not actually as apartments. He told me that he had concerns about, um, you know, the numbers as well, but that he needed to seek more information. And he was, do you're talking about the police commissioner? Yeah. And that he was going to do that. He didn't give me anything specific, but he told me that he wanted to ensure that there wasn't uneven enforcement going on across the city, that it was a major concern for him, and that he was going to look at it and get back to me. I wouldn't characterize it that way, but I would say that, that he, he heard the complaints and mm -hmm. the questions from our chairs and that he's going to get back to us. And the mayor said the same thing. And I think, again, as Gloria mentioned, he, the mayor mentioned that last night on New York One. I think the police commissioner had a similar mindset, because I'm sure they spoke about it, on how to figure out what to do on this. So what is your next step? You've spoken to the commissioner, you've spoken to the mayor. 
Well, we're going to continue to analyze this data. We're going to continue to uh, push the PD to move from arrests to summonses. We're going to have conversations with the DAs in New York City. We're going to advocate for state legislation on this. I'm not hopeful it's likely going to happen before the end of this legislative session in Albany. And we're going to continue this conversation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney Vance. <laughs> Thank you all.